we're going to move forward to the next speaker, which will be uh, Julian Morales from Ghent University. Hi, Julian. Hello. Okay. Would you share your screen with us? Sure. Okay. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Yes, we are. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, thanks to the organizers for, for this nice event. So um, I was worried that I will delay uh, this uh, presentation too, too much, but luckily uh, we have a little bit more time. And for those that are soccer fans, we will be able to see the, the match between France and Portugal. So I will make it quick and efficient, I, I hope. Okay, so today I will talk about the acoustic fluidic interferometric device for cells mechanical characterization. This is a work that I developed during the PhD. The PhD was a joint project between France and Italy, and the supervisors are Professor Gianluca Lippi from the French side, and he is an expert on lasers. And from the part of bio, biophysics, let's say, uh, Dr. Massimo Vasalli, that uh, he was at uh, the moment in the CNR in Italy, but right now is in the Glasgow University. Myself, I also move away. Now I find myself in Ghent, in Belgium. Now I'm doing photoporation. I still working with lasers and cells. But today I will talk about uh, this new approach for mechanical uh, cytometry. So I'd like to start uh, pointing out that the cells, for instance, the somatic cells, span for uh, a wide range of different Young's modus basis. That implies that it has different stiffness. They have different elasticity. For instance, they have really elastically compliant uh, lymphoids or myeloids, but really, really stiff cells like a spread osteoblast or the contract, uh, contract muscle. This makes clear that the elasticity or mechanical properties of the cells is a hallmark of the different types of cells. This is an example in humans, but this is daily for the whole animal domain. The main uh, responsible of this, um, of these mechanical properties in cells is the cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton is mainly composed by microtubules and microfilaments. Microtubules uh, here in green are the, those that are, are resisting uh, tension in the cell. So uh, on top of that, I would say that the microtubules are the main participants in the mechanical properties of the cells. Microfilaments are really important as well, but uh, when the cell need to uh, uh, apply some force to the medium, is where the myosin uh, protein moves like in a, a scalpel, but that is a different story. Also, I would like to quote in here, Professor Jochen Gluck that says that whenever a cell change its function or becomes pathologically altered, the cytoskeleton restructures, which inevitably leads to telltale mechanical changes. In order to exemplify this, I will show you this diagram of the, of the mitosis of the cell you, you have in here the nice pictures of the mitosis, but also you can see that during the anaphase, a clear change in the mechanical properties of the cells occur. So you can also use the mechanical properties to track a physiological process on top of distinguishing uh, among different types of cells. And for the pathological part of the uh, point of view, I have this example of the fibroblast in the cancer, breast cancer cells elasticity change. The same group, the professor uh, Jochen Gluck uh, group, use optical tweezers to stretch the cells and they realize that the malignant cells are more elastically compliant, as you can see in here. These are healthy um, fibroblasts, while these are malignant fibroblasts. So we can conclude from this that uh, mechanical properties could be a label-free biomarker. What I mean by label-free is that you don't need to add any uh, chemical uh, stuff to the cells to, to, to track these changes. On top of that, and is relevant for our work, I would like to highlight that the refracted index of the cells is also a, a biomarker. 
starting with the fact that the different uh, organelles has different affected index value, I can conclude and I can uh, also uh, say that the average affected index of the cells is uh, an integral bio biomarker of the state of the cell. On top of that, it is being proved by uh, uh, the group of Liu et al. that changes in the refractive index also occur during mitosis. And also by the, the group of Barty, they show that uh, the refractive index also changed uh, during a breast cancer uh, situation. You can see that the coefficient of the wavelengths for the refractive index for malignant tumors are uh, higher than the normal tissue. So we have two candidates for um, label-free biomarkers in cytometry. This is not new. There exist already several techniques to assess the mechanical properties of the cells. Uh, here are just to mention some of them. Maybe the most relevant one and the most uh, common used one would be the atomic force microscopy. I'm pretty sure that most of you have uh, already heard about it. And these are really good techniques. The only problem is they are not uh, susceptible or high throughput. For instance, just to measure only one cell with uh, AFM, it takes the order of uh, minutes, just one cell. The only approach, as far as I know, that reaches um, high throughput in the mechanical assessment of the properties of the cell is the real-time deformation cytometry. This is a beautiful technique in which uh, they use a high-speed camera to a study and detect in real time the deformability of the cells. And they have a high throughput of 100 cells per second, which is a lot. This uh, throughput allows them to have these really nice um, clusters in these uh, scattered diagrams in which you clearly can differentiate the, the, the cells. It's important for me to highlight in here that um, High throughput leads to statistics, and statistics is the only way to overcome the heterogeneity nature of the cells. If you only measure two of these cells, it's really, really difficult that you can conclude something relevant about it. This technique uh, is really nice, but has uh, one little problem or two, let's say. Uh, it requires special instruments. For instance, the high-speed cameras is not something uh, common to have in the lab, and also you need a, a nice computer that allows you to analyze and process in real time the images. This is not the standard equipment and it's rather expensive. Also, it's rather complicated. This is not a technique that any user can, can, can apply. You need to undergo a high level training to develop techniques like this one. So based on this, we identified that um, it's important to go for cytometry based on mechanical properties of the cells. And it's mandatory that this technology will be uh, able to provide high throughput. Also will be desirable that at the same time allows us to measure the optical properties of the cells as it can be also a level three um, biomarker. It's desirable to be inexpensive and compact. This is because we are thinking that this technology will be of use in low income uh, countries and uh, difficult access regions in the world. So we came with this proposal. This is our uh, device, this is our technology. In here, you can see the flow of cells crossing the Fabry-Perot resonator. I would like to say in here that our technology comprises a microfluidic channel in which the cells are flowing. Uh, also, we couple a uh, piezoelectric transducer to manipulate acoustically the cells. Uh, it allows to place it in the vertical position and also induce acoustic deformation. And in order to analyze and retrieve the information of the deformation, we couple a uh, fabri resonator to the microfluidic channel. This is um, the optical component that allows us to study the cells. Let me provide you more details in here. So this is the schematics of the video that you just showed. Here is the microfluidic channel. In these cells are flowing from left to right. Uh, these are the walls of the microfluidic channel. This gradient of yellow to gray is the, the, the acoustic gradient that we apply thanks to the uh, piezoelectric transducer that is coupled in the bottom of the microfluidic channel. This blue uh, layer in here represents the mirror 
that composes one of the refractive uh, surfaces to create the uh, fabric perot resonator. The uh, first one of the channel is the other reflective surface. So light is coupled with a uh, Microsoft objective. Cells are flowing from uh, left to right and they process our fabric perot resonator. It perturbs the, 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 the beam of the laser. And then this is the, the Microsoft objective that is uh, uh, shown here. Then it, we can redirect to detectors or a CCD camera to process and analyze the situation of the perturbation of the beam laser. Let me give you more details about the cell's acoustic manipulation before going to the optical part. When uh, we match the frequency, the natural resonance frequency of the microfluidic channel, which is governed by the dispersion relation, uh, in a, a standard, a standard uh, equation in, in waves, we can create an acoustic uh, field. In here, you have um, the distribution of the kinetic energy, and in here you have the potential energy and the acoustic inside the well. So when the uh, piezoelectric transducer is activated, everything is forced to, to move into the center. This is how we control the vertical position. We want all the cells moving in one single displacement plane. Uh, in order to to show you how we are doing here, I have this video in which uh, the acoustic is activated, now it's off. You can see by gravitational effects goes down. Then I switch on again the uh, acoustic field and cells go back to the original plane that were, were before. On top of that, if the acoustic pressure is increased enough, the, the cells can be deformed a similar way as uh, Misra um, at, at, at all they did it in this nice work. So you, in here they have red those cells and they are using this exactly same principle, but with higher pressure, they were able to deform the red blood cells of mice. Now we can go to the optical part if you allow me. So what is a fabriperal resonator uh, or interferometer? It's simply a cavity in which you have two um, reflective surfaces perfectly aligned and facing each other. So light that is coupled, coherent light that is coupled can bounce back and forth several times. This uh, bouncing back and forth will create a change in the phase of the light. And this change in the phase of the light, if the, 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 the phase of the incoming light matches the phase of the outcoming light, you will create um, interference, constructive interference. But if the change in phase is pi, so maximum and minimum are opposite, you will create destructive interference. This happens in a circular symmetry inside the etalon. Etalon is how we uh, call the separation between the two mirrors or reflective surfaces that gives you a circular symmetry. This is a picture of the um, fringe pattern that is actually occurring in our resonator. If you take a in here, in the intensity, you will have a plot like this one. And this is the so-called airy transmission function. This is a standard way to characterize any resonator or interferometer in interferometry. Based on the airy transmission function, it's relevant to mention that the separation between two adjacent maxima is called free spectral range. And the full width at half maxima of one of the bright fringes is also called a uh, line width, uh, is, a, is a parameter of relevance. When you take the ratio between the free spectrum range and the full width of Hall maxima, you can define the finesse of the resonator. Again, this is a standard uh, value to characterize our uh, resonator uh, in the interferometry. It's really useful because mathematically is related to different things. For instance, the finesse is directly related to the coefficient of finesse, which is immediately related to the reflectivity of the surfaces. On top of that, the free spectral range is related to whatever is inside the ethanol, times its refractive index and the separation or the optical uh, thickness of the element inside the ethanol. It's important to, to to highlight that the finesse summarizes 
whatever is inside the Crispr program as well. So what happens if we uh, put an actual cell inside of, of a repeater resonator? Well, this is what happens. You can see um, an algae in this case. This is the tracellulist flowing uh, and crossing the resonator axis. And then it perturbs. You can see that clearly perturbs all the areas around the, the resonator, even really far away. And also you pay attention in here, for instance, it seems that appears a new pattern of fringes. We notice that this is valid for uh, pretty much anything that you can put in, inside or the microfluidic channel, in particular for GIST, which has a different geometry, a different uh, refractive index. And you can see that when it crosses the resonator axis also creates a new uh, kind of fringe pattern. So we already have the tools of finesse to analyze the change, this change in the fringe pattern. But we wonder what happens if we take another approach, something that probably easier, easiest or work of analyzing the cells inside the, the, the public resonator. So we said, what happens if we consider that the cell is not a cell, it's just a really thin and small lens that is placed inside. So that is the thing that we did. We approximate the cell as a thin lens. You can see that this is not uh, that crazy because this is exactly the kind of behavior that uh, one could expect if placed uh, a, a thin lens. A change in the face, a change in the fringe pattern. That is why we decide to, to, to go for this approach. So mathematically, this implies that we can establish a matrix for each uh, surface. So in this uh, schematics, light is coming from light, uh, right to left. This is the first uh, surface of the channel wall. This is the actual channel wall where the cells is placed. This is the, the glass of the mirror that we are using. And each of them has a matrix. You can correlate them in here. And then we have a matrix corresponding to the, the cell that is placed inside. Remember that we can ensure that it's exactly in the middle of the microfluidic channel because we have the acoustic manipulation. So we do that. that. We consider the cell as a, as a thin lens. We do the algebra and we can get the entrance for each matrix, which only depends on the focal length of the lens that is inside and the mechanical characteristics of the microfluidic channel. Going further, we can uh, retrieve from this the radius of curvature of both the incoming and the outcoming light of of the system. And together with this equation, we can do more algebra and we can relate the distance from the center to each of the bright fringes to the actual focal length of this, the lens that is placed inside the microfluidic channel. This is how we can uh, create and talk now about a cell focal length. We can compute the cell focal length on the changes that I, we saw before in the video, just measuring the distance from the center and each of the fringes, uh, right fringes that you're finding here. So this is what we did. Um, and to summarize the idea that I just present, so we have a cell, we have a piezoelectric transducer that allows us to deform the cell, and we have three parameters, the cell focal length, the free spectral range and the finesse, that this is kind of cheating because the free spectral range is actually included in the finesse. So at the end, I will only report the cell focal length and the finesse. But whenever it changes the size of the cell, I will change the optical path of the light. And this change on the optical path will be reflected in the cell focal length and the finesse. It's important for me here to, to, to be really clear that the finesse is a parameter that is providing information on both on the papiperal resonator or of microfluidic channel and the optical path that is defined by the cell, while the cell focal length is depending only on the optical path defined by the cell. So cell focal length will be a, a straightforward measurement of the cell, while the finesse is, is also a measurement of the cell uh, optical thickness, but together with the effect of the resonator. Okay, so we are ready now to test our, our device. 
We use two biological samples, the Tocelmist again and the GIST that I showed you before, and two synthetic samples, which is the microgel beads. These beads are especially designed and created by Salvadore Girardo, a group, really strong group in Germany, to test uh, techniques like uh, real time deformation cytometry and also standard polystyrene three micron uh, diameter beads. You can see that uh, with these synthetic samples are in the streams. The material bits are really, really soft. It's only 1.7 kilopascals, while the polystyrene bits are really, really stiff. It's 3.25 gigapascals. It's worth to note um, that in our configuration, we are expecting to apply only 15 kilopascals in acoustic pressure. So we don't expect to be able to deform any of the polystyrene beads. In the other case, in the case of the biomedical samples, uh, algae it doesn't have anything special. When I say it doesn't have anything special, I refer that uh, it's a pretty standard cytoskeleton, it's a pretty standard membrane. Just in the other hand, uh, it has a really stiff membrane. The, the membrane stiffness is about 112 megapascals. So in bulk, it will be much more lower the, the, the Young's model of the whole cell, but for sure it has to be stiffer than the algae. So we test this with our device. And happily, we noticed that uh, first, both uh, numbers matches, the thinness and the focal length matches, and also the, the stiffness that we expect to see for each sample is the thing that we are observing it here. You can see that the microgel is the most uh, elastically compliant one in both uh, parameters. Then algae is the next one as well in the focal length. GIST is a slightly less elastically compliant, but it still is able to be deformed in both cases. And polystyrene remains pretty much uh, the same, but it means that we didn't uh, deform polystyrene as we expected. Also, another important thing to, to notice in this slide is that the statistically significant difference are more clear in the focal length. You can see that the microgel is more clear, the algae is more clear, and the gist is more clear, while for the finesse, it's not that clear. Uh, the, the gist will be the main difference. You can see it's easier to observe the deformation in the focal length than with the finesse. Then uh, all the algebra that we did before is paying the price. We are happy about that. Uh, and you can see also that polystyrene remains the same. So these results match as the theory is good. Uh, and this was good enough to, 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 to motivate SAT, which is a, an institution to transfer technology in France to look for the pattern. So together with the University of Côte d'Azur, they decide to, to find a patent uh, based in our technology to the European Patent Office. This was good for us, but in the sense of publication wasn't that good because we undertook an embargo period that was released uh, uh, pretty much at the end of last year. And this together, uh, the COVID pandemic situation in the world, it has delayed our uh, publication of our results. I really hope that uh, really soon you can see one paper about this work coming to light. But uh, this is still ongoing. Hope that it doesn't take more than a couple of weeks. Okay, uh, so what is next? Um, we, we want to reach the real-time analysis. We want to, to, to reach uh, a system that is also really compact. For that, we want to build it, for instance, in PDNES with the laser and the micro channel and the Yes, so electric transducer coupled up together in a really compact device. I'm picturing right now something like 10 centimeters times four centimeters, and it's really, really simple to connect with, uh, I don't know, a syringe tubing, something like that. Again, it's important for us that we cheap, so we can uh, put this technology to the reach to anybody that is interested in to use it, because we also foreseen um, diagnosis application of this technology. So it would be really, really nice for malaria, for sickle disease, for leukemia, different diseases that uh, pretty much uh, is not that hard to get the diagnosis in developed labs. But when you are in a remote access and different countries, will provide a, a nice help, these kind of devices. 
And also, uh, I didn't make that much emphasis when I presented this before, but in the AFM, when you use a different um, a different tip to to test the mechanical properties of the cells, it it alters the measurement. It changes the values that you obtain. You obtain. So since this is a contactless technique, we are hoping and we forecast that this will be a way to standardize the measurement and the values for the mechanical properties of different cells. I would like to finish uh, analogizing uh, uh, Dr. Stefan Barlan from the Institute of Physics of Nice. Uh, the discussion with him was really uh, important to reach in a nice culmination of this project. Also, Dr. Peter Vinnie Jones from the Southampton University. He helped us to design and build the microfluidic channel. And Dr. Marcus Sotore, Elvates uh, CTO. Uh, he helped me a lot to organize and put together the electronics behind the device. It was quite a challenge. And I'm really thankful with the Dr. Sotore. And finally, I thank you for your attention and for your time. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, Julia. I believe there are some questions in the question. Yeah. We have two questions. Uh, if the if you want to open your microphones and ask, you are welcome. If not, I can read it. Dr. John Marie, Dr. Manuel Pireto, and Genilda Castro de Omena Neta. Would you like to, to? Now you can hear me, yeah? Okay. You hear me? Yep. Oh, so my question is, uh, in your introduction, you focus on, on the cytoskeleton. And my question was, what could be the contribution of the membrane in this, all the measurements you are doing? Can you exclude definitively that uh, I would speak about the lipid bilayer and the lipid and the protein that constitute this membrane. Can um, you exclude that they participate to the mechanical properties? No, 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 of course not. I, I just make more emphasis because it's, it's the, the, the main participant, as far as I know, the cytoskeleton, but of course the membrane plays a, a main role. Uh, and mechanical properties are an integral uh, biomarker of the gene expression inside the cell, so it affects everything. Even the nucleus, the change in the mechanical properties of the nucleus can be reflected in the bulk uh, mechanical properties of the cell. So neglect uh, any of the parts uh, is, is not would be the ideal, but it's important at the very beginning to focus on the main participants and then add uh, variables, right, to, to make it at the end a little bit more complicated. That's why I focus more on the cytoskeleton. But with, with you, yeah, with your method, you can make the difference between the two contributions, the one yeah. coming from the cytoskeleton and the one coming from the membrane? Um, that is not clear. Base it only on the mechanical properties of the cell that will be challenging. But if we manage to couple with the results of the change of the refractive index, if we split, for instance, the cell focal length value, and we can see for one side the contribution of the change in size and the change in the refractive index, okay. it will be possible uh, to, to differ differentiate from which part of the cell is coming with this change. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Congratulations. Okay. There's one other question from Genilda. Uh, and she asks, as a basis for cell shape parameters, could it be applied to infer on pathological conditions? Yes, totally. We, we, that is uh, actually one of the main goals for that, to track and, and infer in early stages pathological, pathological conditions. It's, 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 uh, the idea behind it is really simple. It's the, thing, it's the same thing that you do when you go to the supermarket and you try to, to pick the best apple or not. You just first you watch it and then you touch it. And by touching it, you can infer things that uh, you can uh, not infer with another medium. So the main targets for us could be, as I said at the end of the presentation, malaria, uh, sickle disease, 
and, and leukemia. And these three diseases is already proven and shown that mechanical changes occur. And now the challenge is like to track it uh, accurately and in a robust way and in a really simple way as well. Okay, and uh, I think there's one question here. Ashi Singh, if you can ask, make your question. You have the, your hand raised. Yeah. Okay, so there's another question for, from Dr. Manuel Prieto. He's asking if uh, your equipment is suitable for high throughput. Yeah, okay, that is a nice question. As I said, yes. Uh, right now, the, all the, the information that I showed was based on uh, images, image processing, which is, is working, is nice, but it doesn't, it, it provides high throughput, but it's not good enough to go for real time analysis of, of the of the cell mechanical properties of the cells. If you remember, I, I showed you that we are using a camera and also two diode detectors. The diode detectors are super fast. So if we move all our analysis to the diode detectors, in principle, there are not constraints in the, the speed that we can reach to analyze the, 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 the throughput of the analysis in the device. That is an ongoing process. Uh, everything is pretty much in the table, but uh, thanks to the coronavirus again, it, it did like uh, a lot of work. But we have a uh, throughput, a good throughput at the moment. We recently reached high throughput, but the real time analysis is, is still on the table, but we are approaching to that uh, quite fast. Okay. Oh, there's one more. What about cells that are in migration and attached? How is that managed? Uh, the difference in biomechanics and acoustic, uh, I mean. Yeah, this uh, is a relevant question. Uh, yeah, of course, our device is pretty much exclusively uh, designed for not adherent cells. This is just for circular thin cells. For uh, cells that grow in attachment, there are another approaches, there are another techniques, um, also projects, but it's, it's not. At the moment, our device is only designed and is only suitable for not adherent cells. And I, I, I'd like to add in here, the mechanical properties of the cells when are uh, in a not adherent situation and when are uh, ad adhered to, to the tissue, change a lot because the extracellular matrix influences a lot the situation of the mechanical properties. Just to example this, when you have uh, individual cancer cells, individual cancer cells are more elastically compliant, but the tumor as, as a together, as a bulk incorporated in the cellular matrix is actually steeper than healthy tissue. So the difference of the mechanical properties between non adherent and bulk cells is quite different. It's actually opposite. Is there any other question? I don't think that. There's another question in the uh, uh, Q&A. Oh yeah, there's another one. Okay, there's one more. Uh, Julia Maranhão asks uh, if you could use your device to collect data on whether a cell is cancerous or not. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, that's the idea, but we are not thinking particularly in one single cell. We are thinking most about, more about um, detection or rare bands. For instance, um, when you have leukemia, will be interesting to analyze a lot of cells in your blood and maybe if you, if you find that, I don't know, less than 1% of the cells in your, in your blood uh, has a different mechanical behavior that will be an indicator of leukemia. So we are not only forecasting, use the device 
to, to diagnose cancer. We are forecasting use the device to diagnose uh, diagnostic leukemia in early stages, even earlier than is possible at the moment. That is, of course, a potential application. But in order to do that, the only way to do it is with high throughput, because as I said, these will be really rare events and you have to measure rare events with a lot of robustness. So high throughput is the answer as well. Uh, I think there are no more questions. So uh, if not, I'd like to uh, congratulate all the speakers and thank you again for, I will ask you to, to put your cameras on. If you could just uh, return to the, to the session, the speakers, at least Elianor, I uh, hope are there and Katri. Um, I can't turn on my camera. It says the host is disabled. It, it, it's just it's just cancelled by host. I mean disabled. You have to okay. allow. <laughs> Sincha. Yeah. Sincha, please. Oh, would you like to talk? So. I have okay. a question. Oh Sorry, yeah, there's a question write. here. <laughs> I couldn't write my question. And my question was from Julian. Yeah. yeah. It was great. Tag. My question was, uh, can this device be used for drug delivery for cancer condition like you per se? For yeah, the actually, yes. uh, yeah, that is a nice question. Uh, as I said before, right now I'm working in photoperation, something related to the, the thing that you are doing. Yes, and yes. we already have some ideas to incorporate or change the device to do uh, drug delivery. But the current configuration, the configuration that I showed today was uh, more intended or is perfectly suitable for drug screening. So for instance, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can use different concentrations and you can track the behavior uh, based on the mechanical properties of the cells. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, I'd like to thank you all again for participating in this uh, webinar. And uh, it was again, uh, very unfortunate that we didn't have Dr. Alan Dalton tonight, uh, today to, 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 to be with us. Uh, as I told you in the beginning, he had a uh, emergency situation in his family. He wasn't able to attend. Hope he can join us uh, in the next uh, opportunity. So with this, I'd like to you know, ask for a round of applause for all, all the speakers to, to the, today and uh, invite you all to uh, join us again in two weeks for the upcoming webinar on mechanisms of membrane protein that will be on uh, July 7th. And uh, before uh, finishing the session, I'd just like to remind you again that uh, we have... Uh, uh, openings for, for applications for UPAD fellowships until the end of the of uh, June at the end of the month. So uh, all um, uh, young scientists, PhD candidates from uh, developing countries can apply. And I'd like to you to to uh, uh, to uh, encourage you to apply and to tell your friends that this opportunity is open. And more information is available in the uh, event web page. So with that, I'd like to, to close the session and thank you again, all the participants and attendees for participating. Have a great week. Thank you, thank you, you very too. much. Have a great Bye. 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 See you guys. Take care. Oh, Manuel. How are you, Manuel? Hey, Java. Good to see you. Good to see Go see the soccer match now. France and Portugal. <laughs> no, well... <laughs> Parabéns. No Parabéns para todo mundo que apresentou também. Yeah. Congrats yeah. to everybody, absolutely. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Congratulations. Good to yeah. see you, Tony, as well. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Tony, hi, everybody. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hey, Good man. to see you. Hi, yeah, Tony. In the How northern, are you? Yeah, here well. in the northern hemisphere, well, uh, hot weather and everything. Bye-bye. Yeah, really. see you guys. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Good to yeah. see you. See you next time. <laughs>